Court on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Assistant Professor of History of Latin American and Latino Studies at University of Illinois, Chicago, Adam Goodman, on the deportation machine, America's long history of expelling immigrants. Adam, welcome to the program. Thanks, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, let's, you basically provide a, a history of the what you call the deportation machine, the, the mechanism by which we deport uh, far more people than I think um, w w is conventional wisdom or is officially uh, recorded. Um, and you, you describe that there are basically three primary um, uh, mechanisms or, uh, or, or functions of this machine, um, formal, voluntary, and self. Let's, I, I guess let's start with uh, voluntary and self, because that is more, um, those are phenomena that have existed uh, for a longer period of time, I guess. That's right. You know, one of the startling discoveries I made while researching this book during the past decade is that, you know, rather than an affect of the Trump era, as many people are paying attention now, the history of deportation and the deportation machine dates back to the late 19th century. And the United States has deported 57 million people since then, almost, you know, 85 to 90 percent by coercive means, as you mentioned, voluntary departures, which are euphemistically named. There's nothing voluntary about them at all, as well as self-deportation campaigns meant to scare people uh, into leaving the country, supposedly on their own. But as I show in the book, it's in response to concerted efforts of government officials, as well as ordinary citizens. And, you know, these occur without due process. Um, they instill a tremendous amount of power and authority in low level agents of the state, which I think these days we can all understand how and why that might be problematic whether it's the police in our nation's cities or immigration agents uh, on the border and in, in the interior of the country. And the deportation machine has always been based on this discretionary authority for low-level officials. Now, voluntary departures, unlike formal deportations, which we come to think of as by an immigration judge historically, these are the 400,000 deportations per year the Obama administration was carrying out these are just a small sliver of the total, well, as I mentioned. Adam, let me just uh, interject or uh, ask for for just a moment. So, when, when, when the when the conventional wisdom expresses how many deportations we have had in our history, is there even a number that they cite, or is it just simply like since 1980 and and or or, or, or some other date? And when they give that number, what what is that number? Is it just those official deportations that you're talking about? That's right. So most people, I think, social scientists, journalists, and the public understand that it's within the last 20, 25 years that deportations have spiked. And there have been 8 million formal deportations throughout the last 150 years. Now, this, as I mentioned, pales in comparison to the voluntary departures, which number 48 million plus. So what my book does is shows that if we want to understand the history of deportation, its impact on immigrant communities and on the nation, then we need to be looking at these coercive means, these informal means that the, the machine is dependent on from the start. All right. So let's, I mean, let's talk about those informal means and, and, and uh, when did they basically, I mean, it's almost like they didn't, it's not so much that they, they started uh, uniquely, but it's almost like they'd never ended, right? When we formalized other processes, that didn't get, there was still just a tremendous amount of discretion. It, it feels like that. But um, uh, tell us about the development of, 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 those, of those processes. Of course. So before the federal immigration bureaucracy existed, before the federal government had control over immigration, and that was only in the 1890s that that happened. Uh, people who are local and state officials, as well as just ordinary citizens, made their own rules and enforced their own laws to decide who could stay, who had to go. Sometimes this was done by law enforcement officials, but oftentimes it was done through uh, self-deportation campaigns, through uh, fear campaigns that relied on the media, through restrictive laws, through threats of violence, and sometimes very real deadly violence. 
that people then leverage to encourage people to leave. And what happens is in the late 19th century, a bunch of activists, and I use that word uh, concern, you know, consciously because they were pushing for anti-Chinese legislation in the West Coast, primarily in California and Washington Territory. They organized to drive the Chinese community, the Chinese laborers, out of the West Coast, who they saw as a threat culturally, economically, as well as a public health threat. And they tried to do so through violence and through coercive means. But they also tried to push the federal government to implement laws excluding the Chinese, which they succeeded in doing in 1882, which was then renewed many times after that. Now, one of the real surprising things that I found in the research was I thought that kind of that assertion of federal power over immigration would lead to less of the informal coercive means, but instead those informal coercive means got baked into the machine itself, which continued to rely on them. Now it's just the federal authorities who exercise that power. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about like the impetus. And we talk about anti-immigrant sentiment at that time. Um, what, did, what did the economic um, implications of these immigrants mean in terms of, uh, uh, was it, it was, uh, I mean, I guess in the context of the Chinese, they're, uh, uh, associated with the building of the railroad. Was there a sense that they were taking, um, labor opportunities away from, uh, folks who are already here? Well, just outline for me, like what the economic argument was. I understand the xenophobic one, right? I mean, and, and pre- I would imagine the level of ignorance at that time was probably even higher. Uh, than it is today, although it's hard to imagine mm. certain times. But um, from an economic perspective, um, w- what was the argument in in these campaigns that existed? You know, because now we hear like, well, we don't want uh, undocumented immigrants to come in and get uh, free, you know, free schooling. We don't want undocumented immigrants to come here and 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 be on the dole. We don't want uh, undocumented immigrants to get health care. Well, none of this was provided by the government at that point anyways. So uh, give us a sense of what, what, the, what the argument was at that time relative to, uh, it could be Chinese and, and, and Mexicans, of course. So this is a good example of how things have not changed, perhaps, over time. You know, one of the things that I discovered as I dug a bit deeper into the research was there's a lot of continuity. You know, the groups that deportation machine targeted has changed over time. And the reasons have sometimes as well, but largely it's you know, the same, the same um, justifications for why authorities and why people in this country, you know, targeted immigrants. And certainly the cultural, the racial, um, public health, those factors matter a great deal. I don't think we can separate those from the economic, but to get to your question, the economic threat as perceived uh, by white working men primarily who organized actively against Chinese laborers was that they were taking the jobs of white laborers. And many of these white laborers themselves were immigrants, Irish immigrants who had arrived maybe 10, 20, 30 years earlier uh, before the Chinese or perhaps even at the same time. And this is something that we see certainly since that period that immigrants have always been used as scapegoats for economic woes. And I think real economic pressures and even uh, suffering. You know, I don't want to deny that. I think that that is very real. The difference is that immigrants are a convenient scapegoat rather than the actual cause, and targeting them might serve the interests of um, xenophobic racist politicians or of people on the local level that want to you know, justify why they're facing these troubles and hardships, but it actually doesn't address the root cause of the problem. All right, fair enough. And so, um, uh, so moving forward, you talk about this dynamic where when the federal government gets involved, you're, you would have anticipated that there would be um, less discretion down the line, that there would be formal policies and some type of like a, a formalization of the process, but it's the opposite. How does that work? So what happens is that the federal government is granted the power to formally deport people in the late 19th century, but they're not given the resources. Congress does not, appropriate uh, sufficient monies for federal immigration officials to carry out their actions. And I don't know if the nation would have stomached it either, perhaps, and we could argue or debate that. But uh, I think that the key factor was that federal officials did not have the ability to carry out the law 
as stated by the books, and that was their task. So they turned to other means. They got creative. They figured out ways to expand their power and influence and authority. And these came through informal deportations, through the voluntary departures, which I liken in the book to uh, the plea bargains within the criminal justice system. You know, if, if a prosecutor threatens someone with 20 or 30 years in, in prison, perhaps they'll agree to a four or five year sentence, understanding the threat. Formal deportations you know, were used in a similar way by authorities who leveraged them and the harsher consequences they carried to get people to leave voluntarily, even though, again, uh, that was under the threat of coercion and uh, forcible removal. Was the threat always with official sanctions? In other words, was it, you know, we're going to put you into the system and you're going to go to you're going to go to court and you're going to get, you know, uh, held? Or was it like you got three days and we're going to come after you? Well, I think I think it was a bit of both. And, you know, the former would be that you know, more commonly they would be threatened with an indefinite period of detention. They would be threatened with perhaps multi-year, even lifetime bans on re-entering the United States. And authorities knew how to wield that power to try to convince people to sign a document that forfeited any due process rights they had, you know, gave up the ability to fight their case, and then you know, left the country. Now, that was something that I think we've seen for the last century has been used strategically to the point that um, it became very common for many immigrants to be deported multiple times within the same year and certainly within the same period of years, such that people had many experiences with immigration officials. And I think that although some scholars and others have described voluntary departures as you know, not punitive, we need to recognize the impact, cumulative impact that they had on both individuals and the role they played in creating these harmful stereotypes of Mexicans as prototypical illegal aliens. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I want to get to that part, but uh, the, the 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 cost associated with that. Um, but it there, it feels like it was a little bit like there's a there's a a kabuki quality to this, right? Where it's like um, if you leave now, you can come back in and we'll throw you out again, and then you can come back in and we'll throw you out again. And as long as we do that, it's like like we're playing a game of tennis or something. And it's really just, this is, this will keep us employed and it will mm-hmm. give you, you know, you're not, you're not going to be, it's going to, it's going to be a little, a little bit of hardship. It's going to be, you know, uh, you're not going to be able to make any plans. You're not going to, there's a lot of costs associated, but it's better than going to jail. And it's almost like there's this, there's this like self licking ice cream cone that's, that's created. What, what, what purpose did it serve from the perspective of the, the border patrol or whatever entity was basically making this tacit agreement with uh, would be deportees. And what value did that provide the federal government or the local government? Was it just simply like from a political standpoint? I mean, like if there's no official record of these people being sell, you know, voluntarily deported or self deported, where does the value come in for this process? It's a great question, and I think it's an important one as well to understand. I mean, the immigration bureaucracy has strategically used these inflated numbers, right? They, they're able to inflate the numbers by deporting people multiple times, and as you described, people return after expulsion, they're apprehended again, and that in turn allows the immigration bureaucracy to show how, well, you know, how many apprehensions it's making, how many deportations it's executing. It's not documenting them in physical records, but they are checking off how many people they're apprehending and how many deportations they're carrying out. And then in turn, they could use that to say, number one, look at all the great work we're doing from their perspective. And number two, we need more money. We need more congressional appropriations. Uh, and so they justified it in that way. And they used it strategically to expand their, their power within the federal government. And this is something we see over the course of the 20th century. And I think that they're, you know, they're also just dealing with kind of the deck that they were dealt and that Congress and perhaps the country never you know, wanted to give them the resources necessary. But it also, in some way, the system did work for the immigration officers as well as for employers who depended on cheap, exploitable labor and in turn for consumers who didn't mind paying rock bottom prices. 
So it was just like a, everybody was sort of participating on some level in some type of like fraud. And the biggest cost is just associated with the immigrant who is basically just like a like a pinball in this whole system. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, we should be careful here not to say that, you know, migrants were willingly participating in this. Uh, this was certainly not something that anyone engaged in uh, voluntarily or that they wanted to be a part of. I mean, I, it's important to recognize the show in the book that the threat of going to work each day. I, mean, I talked to one man who I interviewed in Mexico and Jalisco in central western Mexico, and he described in the 1970s, late 1970s, where he worked on a ranch in California. He would get up every morning, get dressed, and casually hide $20 on his body somewhere, knowing that there was a real possibility each and every day the Border Patrol would come, apprehend him, and deport him to Tijuana. And he wanted to have a little bit of money on him so that he could figure out a way uh, to return to California. But you know that was something that he internalized and presented to me in a way that made it seem very normal. But I think there's also a real cost associated with that. And the fact that you know, so many people you know, lived that experience while their labor was both demanded and also recruited heavily by U.S. officials and employers. But then in turn, you know, they're the ones that, um, as you say, you know, bore the brunt of these um, harmful policies. And physically, psychologically, materially, you know, migrants have not been at the center of immigration policy throughout U.S. history. And I think you know, that's something that, that we should change moving forward. Um, and so uh, when we talk about these costs, I mean, these are just we're talking about human costs to the well-being of these individuals who from whom there's a tremendous amount of value being extracted. That's correct. And I would also just say that you know, these individuals uh, oftentimes are long term residents or U.S. citizens, um, people who are married to U.S. citizens, who have U.S. citizen children. It's important to break down any kind of false binary between us and them that we so often hear coming out of Washington. And let's talk about the um, the dynamic where there are so many more Mexicans who are deported relative to the number of undocumented immigrants uh, in this country. Or, you know, and, and this is over time. I mean, it's a to the extent that it, it continues now, but I mean, over time, this has been the case. Um, what, what accounts for that? And what does that, what does your work show that that, what did that mean? I mean, it, like, what, like, what is, is it just simply a function of this self licking ice cream cone? It's the easiest thing to do to generate numbers. Um, is there, is there some other greater meaning to it? Well, we, we have to think historically here. I mean, why were Mexican uh, Mexicans invited to this country and recruited to come to this country as laborers in such large numbers? And if we think of the late 19th, early 20th century, we see a series of successive immigration laws that limited uh, and more or less cut off labor migration from Asia, as well as from Southern and Eastern Europe. So as, that, as those sources ended, employers turned more and more south toward Mexico. And there were exceptions put in place for migrants from the Western Hemisphere. So Mexican laborers you know, came to be the go-to source, in part because of the geographic proximity. And I think we should recognize the historical relationship between the United States and Mexico and the fact that up until the middle of the 19th century, um, you know, a third of the United States was part of Mexico. So immigration officials targeted Mexicans disproportionately, in part because they were the main source of labor in part because the policies never allowed them to regularize their status. They just invited them here as short-term laborers, um, guest worker program contracts of six months that they'd have to come back and forth. But that cumulative targeting of Mexicans and disproportionate targeting such that Mexicans represent around maybe one half of the undocumented immigrant population in the United States, but around 90% of the deportations. And that, aside from kind of the individual costs or the community costs, I think has gone a long way to solidifying, creating and solidifying stereotypes of Mexicans as illegal immigrants. And that, I think, is very harmful when we think about questions of membership, who, it, who is an American, who is not, what does it mean to be American? 
And is that just me basically because it's like, okay, we've got these, um, you know, I don't know, these Irish uh, guys who have overstayed their, uh, their visas. They're here uh, without documentation at this point. Uh, but to, in, you know, informally kick them out of the country, it's going to be trickier uh, on some level, right? Or, or is, I mean, what, what is it? Why is that? I mean, is it just, are Mexicans low hanging fruit because they're easier to um, exploit uh, w within the context of, of the way that our, our you know, uh, the, the sort of the implicit, I don't know, the racism or the, the bias against them? I mean, what, like, what, what, is it just because it's easy? We can just put literally physically push them across the border and they're back home. What, I mean, what, why, why is there that disparity? I think part of it is the racist policies that have long dictated uh, our immigration control. Part of it is the geographic proximity, as you mentioned, uh, to the, between the two countries. And, you know, I think that those two things uh, combined, you know, go a long way to explaining why, but we should also recognize that you know, there's been a long history of exclusion from the organized labor movement in this country as well. It's not really until the 1970s that that starts to change. Uh, and I have a couple chapters in the book that, that address this, but, you know, Mexican workers were brought here on these short-term contracts. They were you know, not able to organize and they were actively excluded from the labor movement, whereas other groups might've had some protections in place uh, because of their union status. So it's, I think those combination of factors, in addition to the fact that the, the country's always depended on and needed a steady supply of exploitable labor and Mexicans after the exclusionary immigration laws cut off other sources of labor from abroad came to serve that role. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, and I, and I want to, I, you know, I want to sort of loop back around in the seventies because there was a, there was a, a movement that, that, that culminated in, in a uh, Supreme court ruling that I, I wonder from your perspective, it's implicated with this latest one in terms of, of refugees. But before we get there, um, the number of Mexicans who are in prison or uh, uh, undocumented immigrants who are imprisoned um, in this country um, and how that has risen. I mean, I, I, I seem to remember in the aughts, maybe like a report that uh, some of these for-profit prison places were basically saying, look, we're having a little bit of a problem. Our, our local supply of prisoners is drying up. And so we're starting to reorient towards uh, immigrants. And it certainly feels like that was a business plan that uh, was executed. Uh, talk to that element of this. And this is a key part of understanding the contemporary deportation machine. And that's the increasing role that private corporations have come to play on immigration policy. And, you know, the book shows that private companies have always been involved and have profited from deportation and the misery of migrants. But it's really in the last, you know, 15, 20 years that they've played an outsized role, I'd say, in immigration detention. Companies like the Geo Group, Core Civic which used to be known as the Corrections Corporation of America. They've seen immigration detention expand as a part of their multi-billion dollar portfolios. And they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying, um, or sorry, they've spent millions of dollars lobbying Washington and received hundreds of millions of dollars in US government contracts in return. So you know, these are you know, some key changes. You know, we have seen a punitive turn, you might say, to the deportation machine in the last quarter century. And the increasing number of people detained, the increasing length of detention has been a crucial part of that. But another key, I think, aspect of how and why deportation has become more punitive is that formal deportations, which are oftentimes preceded by multi or by long-term uh, detention stays and carry harsher consequences than the voluntary removals they have been streamlined over time. So there's a series of laws and policies that have made formal deportations resemble voluntary departures and the lack of due process they provide. So now people are facing more punitive realities and also fewer opportunities to fight for the right to stay. Um, so there was in 19, um, I guess it was like a, a, a shoe factory 
That's in, right. in in the near Los Angeles. And uh, yeah. and and they were um, uh, they basically said when I guess it was I don't know if it was ICE at that time, uh, but when the Immigration and Naturalization Service INS shows up, they refuse to answer their questions, right? Without I guess without a warrant or what? Uh, tell us about that, and then I want to talk about the uh, recent court case about uh, rights afforded to um, uh, to would be refugees. Now, people have constantly fought against the deportation machine, and I'm able to trace this history, and I really bring it out in the 1970s, especially in this particular case you're describing about a shoe factory in South El Monte in the San Gabriel Valley in suburban Los Angeles. And in May 17th, 1978, a group of 40 immigration officials descends upon the shoe factory surrounds it, closes off all the exits, goes through the factory indiscriminately questioning everyone who looked undocumented or illegal. In other words, all of the primarily Mexican and few Central American employees of the 700 people that work there. They returned that morning to downtown Los Angeles with 119 people in custody. And by four or five o'clock that afternoon, just eight hours later, half of those people were already headed to the Mexican border for expulsion on INS buses, but the buses never made it to the border that day. And what the chapter does is it traces the history of this incredible fight, this organizing struggle, because what happened to the surprise of everyone involved was that behind the scenes, right after the the raid occurred, a group of labor organizers, activists, lawyers, and the migrants themselves, as well as some ordinary citizens mobilized They filed uh, an injunction with a federal judge who signed it and blocked the deportation. They ended up fighting their cases, and the majority of those people ended up winning. And that identified a weak spot in the deportation machine, which is something that I think people are still doing today, of course, trying to figure out where the vulnerable spots are and then apply pressure to them. And they were able to win the right to stay. In addition to, over a longer term, through a class action suit, uh, ensure that immigration officials provided migrants with basic. Uh, Miranda type rights about the right to uh, a lawyer and to legal aid, the right to remain silent. And these didn't stick over time, but it scared the immigration bureaucracy to no end. You know, they were incredibly frightened that more and more people might start rejecting voluntary departure, might start fighting their cases, which would have brought the deportation machine to a grinding halt. And I think that that's an important reminder. Now, where are we with that uh, strategy or tactic today? Because it feels to me like there has been a lot more resources put into, there's been a lot more resources put into um, formalizing that process. And there's been a lot more latitude for uh, the detention, the imprisonment, the punitive uh, things to take place without having to really go through as many steps. That's correct. You know, I think that one of the things I also found in the research is that the vulnerable spots or the weak points in the deportation machine are constantly changing over time, as are migrant strategies and organizer strategies about how to contest them. So today, the machine doesn't look like it did in the 1970s. Uh, And in fact, it doesn't look like it did five or six years ago. I mean, in some general sense, it's the same. But Who's in the White House matters a great deal. And I think organizers in the immigrant community have been trying to strategize and figure out new ways uh, to defend themselves and defend their communities. That can take a little while because it's always this give and take, this back and forth between the immigration uh, enforcement agency and the migrant community. So I don't think that they are the same today. But one thing that is similar is that more and more people uh, today are deported through these streamlined fast track uh, expulsions. And the recent Supreme Court ruling on last Thursday, the uh, Department of Homeland Security uh, versus uh, Thura Singham, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, it basically gave authorities the ability to deport people through the formal means and limited any judicial review or oversight for the vast majority, if not all of those cases, And the second thing that it did very consequentially was it limited the ability for people to exercise any due process rights 
if they are apprehended soon after crossing uh, the border or soon after entering into the country. So these are you know, real blows. I think a, a very consequential decision that will have far reaching impact uh, and certainly you know, not one that most people would see as you know, beneficial for the migrant community or for the country or the you know, process of uh, due process and the rule of law perhaps. But I do think that it perhaps we could say fits into this much longer history and falls right in line with the history of expedited expulsions and not providing people with the legal rights that you know we would hope everyone in this country would have. Do you understand how they make that? Uh, how the how the court uh, basically made that decision? I mean, you know, is it like the close proximity to the border and length of time? You you need to you need to like have some. I don't know. Like if if you're if you're 700 miles away from the border and it's been you know four or five days, then all of a sudden. Uh, our constitution, we're, we're, but we are, we must adhere to our constitution. Like, I don't understand the rationale for this. I mean, I, I, I can take a guess. Yeah, you, 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 me, and probably most people. Uh, <laughs> I think people who follow these issues closely, you know, legal scholars and law, immigration lawyers are still hashing out the specifics. Um, you know, what I can say as well is that there have long been exceptions to the rule of law and to the constitutional rights of U.S. citizens, permanent residents, and you know people who are here uh, out of status as well. The Border Patrol and immigration officials have long exercised uh, extraordinary authority within 100 miles of any border. So if you draw a hundred mile, I'm sorry, if you draw a line around the entire continental United States and then go 100 mile inland from anywhere, immigration officials have power that we might not imagine them to have within that that area. And I forget what the exact percentages of the population of the country, but most of the major cities are located in those areas. And you know, many of us are living under, you know, are living in parts of the country uh, where immigration officials might uh, exercise power that we don't imagine them to have. And I think that, you know, this is certainly something that, you know, builds on that history, but even takes it one step further. All right. So, I mean, and I, I appreciate you're a historian, so this is maybe outside your portfolio. But I mean, do you think there is? I mean, what is it? What would it take to change this disposition that has created this machine over, you know, over 150 years now, easily? Um, well, like, is it? Is this a permanent fixture? Is it something that we can diminish? Is it? Uh, uh, is it would it even be better to formalize all this and 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 have less discretion? I mean, what is what's the response to to this reality that that would make our system more humane? That's an important question. And you know, one of the one of the realizations I had doing the research was that immigration enforcement, the history of deportation is not a partisan history where the Republicans are bad, the Democrats are good. I mean, I trace the bipartisan history of punitive policies that presidents and administrations from both parties have rolled out. And I end the book not necessarily on an optimistic note saying that the deportation machine is going to continue regardless of what happens in November and now regardless of which party is in power. Now, I think recent events perhaps um, related to um, you know, Black Lives Matter organizing and what we've seen across the country in terms of the push to abolish the police and defund the police, I think raises important questions about movements we've seen in this past year with organizers uh, pushing to abolish ICE. And whether or not that happens, I think it should be on the table. I think that we should have you know, a broad swath of, of options, some perhaps more far-reaching, idealistic, and utopian, and some that operate within the system as it is. But you know, one thing I would say is that we could make immigration enforcement more of a service agency to the immigrant community and to the nation, as opposed to an enforcement agency. And those two things have always been intention within the immigration bureaucracy. So if we shifted the resources and shifted the identity of the bureaucracy to more of a service organization as opposed to an enforcement organization, that would be a good place to start. 
Adam Goodman, the book is The Deportation Machine, America's Long History of Expelling Immigrants. We will put a link to that book at majority.fm. Appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed the conversation. All right, folks. I'm going to head into the fun half of the program. 